Hello, hello, hello guys and welcome back to Joe's Ventures and today we're going to be doing right before that update by the time this comes out the update for 1.7 should be out so most of these mods should be broken just wait until their update of 1.7 and they should work fine but yeah we've come on with part 40 of our planet zoo mod spotlights can't believe we're getting that far uh already and now we've just got the new north america pack and that's going to be coming and then we've got at least another year of support i believe so it's going to be really really awesome to see what happens over that time so yeah we're going to be starting off with our first animal today we have got the koi by leaf and uh buff zoo oh i forgot that i put it on play anyway here we are really wonderful koi so the koi or the uh more specifically the ninshungoi i believe is the japanese name for them which is an almost a uh, brocaded carp they're basically domesticated color variants of the amur carp that is kept uh, for decorative purposes and all sorts of ponds and things if you've been to a lot of uh, places especially in asia i remember i saw a lot of these in vietnam there was a lot of uh, gardens that had lots of koi and they let you feed them and stuff like that so these guys are a carp and carp are a pretty large group of fish that are found around asia and central europe and there's very uh, various carp species have been domesticated or originally domesticated in east asia and they were used as a food and they're because they are a cold water fish that allows them to survive in uh they're pretty hardy fish and pretty cold water so they don't really need too much to survive so they make a good fish to farm and uh then they found that there was uh many different color mutations that you could find within these populations so basically what they did was they took these color mutations and they kind of kept breeding for them and breeding for them and koi are kind of the descendants of those animals so now we have a uh, koi that pretty much have all sorts of different cool color variations as you can see like this one here really really does look wonderful very interesting history in terms of that so they are believed to be uh, bred from the common carp but they have been extensive hybridization between all sorts of different populations to get all the different morphs and colorations you can get within the car uh, and within the carp so they're originally a moor carp but the shows that there's microchondrial dna uh, is also really just showing they're all over the place just because there's been lots of hybridization between them and there's believed to be about more than a hundred different varieties of uh carp colors and the most common one is the gohaku which is like a white skinned one with a large red mark marking on the top not necessarily this one but there's all sorts of different variations and stuff that come with them it's really really interesting and um yeah the difference between these guys and goldfish is that these guys were kind of like a Goldfish have been selectively bred for like thousand, more than a thousand years. These guys uh, are generally look much larger than koi and they were really only uh, bred in the 16th century in Japan and Europe in the 17th century. So they're necessarily quite a bit younger in terms of their age of domestication. And they tend to be smaller than, uh, they tend to be bigger than goldfish and they have a greater variety of body shapes and not really quite as big. But they are pretty hardy fish they tend to live in cooler water so that helps with um places that want to keep them in cooler climates so they're a good decoration fish also uh you, if you want koi you need to make sure that no predators such as kingfishers otters raccoons badgers hedgehogs they can't get to the animals including um birds of prey as well so you got to be careful generally pretty generalist and they uh pretty interesting so these guys have often accidentally been released into the wild um on every continent except Antarctica, so they're considered an invasive species and a pest, and especially in Australia, they're considered a noctis fish, especially Queensland. And they're known like other carp species because they are quite, uh, they increase the turbidity or like the uh, amount of uh, dust and mud in the water, they increase that and it makes it difficult for other fish that like clear water to survive. So that can be a big issue, but luckily, this. There are big um, efforts to control them. Still a really wonderful animal. I do like myself some good carp and some good koi. So yeah, that was done by Leaf and Blood uh, Buff Zoo, not Blood Zoo. So next, this one was made just by Leaf. We've got a really cool addition. We have the Hood Island uh, Giant Galapagos Tortoise, or just known as the Hood Tortoise, or the Saddleback Tortoise. Really, really wonderful animal here. So. These guys are one of the 15 species in the uh, Galapagos tortoise species complex. 
Because in the game, you see the original Galapagos tortoise, that is just uh, uh, Serendephilus, I believe they just pronounced the scientific name, Naiju. But these guys are actually um, Chelondonius uh, hoodensis, so they're a completely different uh, species. And it's believed to be about 15 species within the complex of the Niger, the Chelodonius Niger um, complex. And this is one of the rarer ones, with a few being extinct, uh, or believed to be extinct. So, these guys, the Hood Island giant tortoises, they were a population uh, that were very heavily exploited uh, where they lived, especially with whalers in the 19th and 18th centuries where there was a lot of uh, peop whalers taking these tortoises off to eat them because they can survive a long time uh, on a boat and they don't really need much feeding, just good fresh food. But luckily there have been some uh, efforts to reintroduce them, with uh, 11 being found at the early 1970s and held at this Charles Darwin Research Center as a breeding colony. And also there's a breeding colony at the San Diego Zoo. And they've all joined like a captive breeding program which tried to keep these animals as pure as possible. Though they are still critically endangered, they have the, the program has been pretty successful and they've released uh, large numbers into the wild. And the estimates from August 2020 is believed to be a little over 2,000 individuals. So a very, very good recovery from them. But the main difference between these guys and other tortoises is that they are actually one of the smaller species of the Galapagos giant tortoises. And they have this really uh, distinct shape to their shells. They've got a real big shell. Uh, Shadowback, uh, saddleback, so they kind of look like they got a saddle, which helps them in their environment because the island that they live on is quite dry, so it allows them to graze higher, so they're kind of like more of a browser. And um, the species name comes from um, the Lafix Hood and the Lafix who lives in, so they're the Hood Island, and they are from Espanola Island, which is also called the Hood Island, so that gives it the name the Hood Island Tortoise. And yeah, as I mentioned, critically endangered. And the thing as well is that a lot of these uh, species, because of whalers moving them around and stuff, a lot of the species are possibly not pure anymore. There are hybrids of extinct species such as Losum's joints, Losum George species, the Pinta Island tortoise. Lots of hybrids of them around, so they've been trying to breed them back and try and get uh, pure animals back pretty much. But look at these wonderful guys. I love the little baby. Very, very cute. But anyway, we're going to be moving on to the next animal. From the Hood Island tortoise, we've got the blunt six-gill um, shark, which was made by Seth, Buff Zoo, Bongo Hardwood, and from Endless Ocean 2, or F. Rico, I believe you pronounce it. So these guys are also known as the cow shark and the largest um, hexachord shark. They grow up to 20 feet or 6 meters long and are found in tropical and temperate waters across the world and live in a bunch of very different habitats, very, very cool animals. So the blunt-nosed six-gill is a specific species of the six-gills. There's also the big-eye six-gill and the Atlantic six-gill, but they show, which shows that they're quite different, but these guys are just the blunt six-gill, blunt-nose. So as I mentioned, these guys get pretty big. Um, they have these blunt snouts that give them their nose, obviously the blunt nose. And they have six rows of saw-like teeth on their lower jaw and uh, smaller teeth on their upper. And you can see they've got like this tan uh, color going on, really, really wonderful looking. And they can grow up to 5.5 meters long or 18 feet and possibly up to 8 meters or 26 feet. Though adult males generally get between 3.1 and 3.3 uh, or 10 to 11 feet, while adult females get between 3.5 to 4.2 or 11 to 14 feet. And the average weight for an adult uh, blunt nose six gill is about 500 kilograms or 1,102 pounds. So these guys, um, generally the size increases with maturity and with the male shark specifically, the sexual maturity of these guys is usually determined by the length of their claspers or their male reproductive organs. So when juveniles have short and flexible ones, mature uh, six gills have a rigid and lo calcified longer ones and that's how you can kind of tell they're sexually mature. And on the other hand, the female's uh, length of weight ratio increases very rapidly on the onset of sexual maturity. And these guys are very, very cosmopolitan. They're found pretty much all over the temperate, temperate and tropical oceans across the world. They can be found in the Pacific Ocean, the Indian and Atlantic, off the coasts of North and South America, uh, Hawaii, Mediterranean, pretty much everywhere. They're very, very cosmopolitan. 
and these guys feed on pretty much whatever they can. Um, they use a bunch of different uh, feeding mechanisms to, uh, they can actually protrude their jaws and vary their methods of feeding depending on the situation. And they use the sawing and uh, lateral tearing to manipulate food in their jaws. They can also lower their pectoral fins right before they strike in order to stop forward uh, movement that helps, helps make them easier to forage. And although they're sluggish, they actually are pretty capable of hunting uh, fast prey. They can eat, they eat a wide variety of things including smaller sharks, fish, rays, squids, crabs, seals, shrimps and chimeras. And pretty much just eat whatever swims into their mouth. And um, they're also opoviviparous, that means the embryos receive nourishment from a yolk sac within the mother. But they all stay within the mother. The litters can typically between have tw uh, 22 to 108 pups. 70 uh, between 60 to 75 uh, or 24 to 30 inches at birth with the largest recorded pup being about 82 centimeters or 32 inches so they're usually born with a lighter color on their belly and they have like this cryptic coloration to help them uh, hide better in the water let's see if we can find the baby there's got to be some babies in here i just need to find them oh there they are there they are very very cute anyway and they tend to reach, females tend to reach sexual maturity at about four and a half meters long or 15 feet and about 18 to 35 years of age while males reach a little bit younger and a little bit smaller at about 10 feet long or 3.15 meters and 11 to 14 years of age. So sadly these guys are listed as near threatened because of their, because despite their extensive range and their, their long uh, Popularity and longevity as a sport fish makes them vulnerable to uh, exploitation if they aren't properly regulated and also such things as bycatch and uh, catching shark fin soup, soup is another bad thing but largely they are pretty harmless to people as well and still just really cool animals regardless. So I am a big fan of these blunt nose, another good fishy for the game. So now we're going to be moving on to the next animal. We have got the mountain goat. This was by Leaf and Nicholas Line Rider. Finally ported as its own uh, full species. Really, really wonderful, aren't you? Look at you. So, the mountain goat, uh, also known as the Rocky Mountain Goat, are an endemic uh, hoofed mammal that is uh, found in the western areas, mountainous areas of Western North America. And uh, pretty, pretty interesting. They're an even toed ungulate, and they obviously that includes groups such as antelopes, gazelles, and cattle. And uh, they belong to the same group as the true goats, uh, caprines, so muskox ta and tarkins are very, very, um, very, very similar to these guys and closely related, which is really interesting. And um, these guys, uh, both male and females, have these really short uh, beards along with these uh, short tails and these long black horns. They get up to about 15 to 28 centimeters or 5.9 to 11 inches in length, which have these yellow rings that can pretty much tell you how... Uh, Fast they grow. And a male goat can stand generally about a meter tall or 3.3 feet at the shoulder uh, to the waist and can weigh considerably more than a female, about 30% more. So male goats also have longer horns and longer beards and your average mountain goat can get between 45 and 140 kilograms or 99 to 310 pounds and billies will often weigh less than 82 kilo, kilo, kilos or 180 pounds and the head to body length ranges for these guys about 120 to 179 centimeters or 47 to 70 inches with a small tail that adds about 10 to 20 centimeters or 3 to 7 inches. So you can see as part of their adaptions to living in the mountain slopes of the Rockies, they have very, very um, cloven hooves. They have cloven hooves and they have sharp dew claws that allow them to uh, grip better to the rocks and such so they don't slip if they get wet or whatever. They also have very, very powerful necks and um, shoulders that allow them to propel up steep slopes and that allows them to climb obviously over rocks and things as their habitat really really interesting so their habitat includes the rocky mountains and the cascade range throughout the west and north america so they can be found from washington idaho montana through british columbia and alberta and the southern yukon in southeast and alaska and there have been um some areas where these introduced populations have been introduced so such as Idaho, Wyoming, uh, Nevada, Oregon, South Dakota, and the Olympic Peninsula in Washington. So there are some introduced populations. 
And they're actually the largest mammal that could be found at high altitudes, and they could be found at exceeding 13,000 feet or 4,000 meters, where they usually sometimes will come down to sea level uh, in coastal areas, but they are primarily a alpine or subalpine species where they stay above the tree line and they migrate uh, depending on the uh, winter season. And in winter, they migrate to low elevations where mineral, uh, mineral licks often take them several kilometers through uh, forested areas. So these guys have a pretty generalist diet. They pretty much just eat whatever grasses, herbs, ferns, mosses, and lichens they can find. Also, low-growing shrubs and conifers is another issue for them. And in captivity, they will eat grains, fruits, vegetables, and grass. So in the wild, mountain goats usually live between 12 and 15 years, and their lifespan is limited by wearing down their teeth. Though in zoos, they could live up to 20 years. And they reach sexual maturity at about 30 months old, and the nannies uh, will herd undergo a synchronous estrus through late October through early December, with the time the females and males partic- uh, often participate in mating rituals. We'll have a look at the babies while we're talking about that. So often the males will kind of rot, uh, similar to deer, they'll hit each other and compete over the females. And then they'll, after the breeding season over, the males will move away from the females and they'll form these loose uh, nursery groups, about up to 50 animals. And after a six month gestation period, these cute little kids are born around late May to early spring, uh, early June in the spring, and usually just one offspring. And they can weigh about three kilos at births and begin to climb within hours of being born. Lactation is mostly done in one month. The kids will follow their mother for the first year of life until the nanny gives birth again. And uh, the nannies will lead, lead them out of danger and take care of them until they are big enough and ugly enough to take care of themselves. So another cool fact about these guys is that they can be very, very aggressive and uh, protective of their babies, which I think is a pretty cool fact. And um, they've been known to uh, fight against animals such as wolves, wolverines, lynx, and bears. Though their primary pe- primary predator is the mountain lion, which is large enough to kill even large adults. Though nannies have sometimes had to defend their young from bald and golden eagles. And they've actually been... Uh, Observe trying to dominate the more passive and often heavier um, big, bighorn sheep that share their territory. So that's another, and they're also very aggressive towards humans. So if you um, see them, avoid them. And there has been at least one recorded fatality by mountain goat, which is a very silly way to die, but you know, can't really argue with that. So yeah, a really, really wonderful animal. I do like myself a nice mountain goat. So yeah, we're going to be moving on to the next animal. We have got. Uh, this one was made by Leaf. I believe it was ported from uh, the Ultimate Animal Collection Zoo Tycoon uh, pack. So let's have a look at this wonderful fella. We have got the Tasmanian Devil. Look at him go. So the Tasmanian Devil is a carnivorous marsupial that it was recently only just found in the island state of Tasmania, but has been reintroduced in New South Wales in mainland Australia, where it used to live a few thousand years ago. And since the extinction of the thylacine, sadly, in 1936, they are the largest carnivorous marsupial. And, um, yeah, these guys are just really, really cool. So they're the largest surviving carnivorous marsupial, where they have this really uh, squat build, as you see here. The model doesn't perfectly represent their body shape. They tend to have really big heads. They have squat, thick bodies with a large head and a tail that's about half their body length. And um, they can uh, run up to about 13 kilometers an hour or 8.1 miles for short distances. And you can see they've got this black fur with these irregular uh, white patches down their chest and their back. And these markings suggest that these devils are most active during dawn and dusk. And they're thought to uh, uh, draw biting attacks uh, towards less important areas of the body. So they kind of concentrate in scars. So they try to avoid biting each other on the face and things because so, that can be dangerous for them. And um, devils usually get to about... Um, males are usually larger than females with a body length of about two, 652 millimeters or, or uh, 25.7 inches or uh, with a 10 inch tail or 258 millimeter tail. And they get on average around 8 kilograms while the females are slightly smaller getting to an average 6 kilograms. So uh, they're also pretty stocky as you see here. That gives them a low center of mass. And I think they're just really cool animals regardless. 
Devils are usually about fully grown at about two years old, but the few devils and few devils live longer than um, five years in the wild, which is a little bit sad. Um, most marsupials kind of live fast, die young, and potentially the longest lived uh, Tasmanian devil in captivity uh, lived for about more than seven years. And they tend to store their fat in their tail, which is largely non-prehensile and just basically kind of adds as a counterbalance and helps with locomotion and things. Also a social um, uh, marker as well. And another interesting little fact about these guys, they have the most powerful bite force relative to body size after any other mammalian carnivore with a bite force of about 553 newtons and can open their jaw about 80 degrees which allows them to generate the largest amount of power to tear through meat and bone. And it actually allows them to bite through thick metal wire. And it's believed that this is quite similar to hy uh, hyenas through convergent evolution. And they had this adaption because they were kind of scavengers slash uh, meso predators where they had to deal, especially recent history, animals like thylacines. But going back further into prehistory, they had to deal with animals like that, like a Leo, and they kind of would scavenge off them. So these guys... Uh, Historically, were only found in Tasmania. Prehistorically, lived pretty much all over the uh, Australia. But and recently, they were reintroduced into areas of New South Wales as kind of a Aussie arc. Um, what's what's the word like a conservation or rewilding program, where they um, introduce them to uh, help create an isolated population because of the facial cancer disease. And luckily they have been known to breed there and they said they'd be doing well. And also there is also believed to be a benefit because they clean up roadkill and actually control cat and fox numbers. Since it's Tasmania, cats and foxes have struggled to establish because of the presence of devils. So that's pretty interesting. So as I mentioned, there are keystone species. They're a um, nocturnal and crepuscular hunter where they kind of just eat what they can and they don't have any evidence of torpor. They tend to big burrows and do not form packs and they spend most of the time alone once weed. And though they're solitary, their social interactions are considered poorly understood. So they do believe to interact somewhat, but they're not really social. They're interested in each other too much. And they can take up uh, down prey up to the size of a small kangaroo, and they'll pretty much eat whatever they can. Usually they're scavengers. They'll eat wallabies, betongs, uh, potaroos, penguins, fish, fruit, visual matter, pretty much anything they can get their mouths around. And it's also believed before the extinction of the thylacine, these guys would eat thylacine joeys uh, left alone in their dens when the parents were away. Which is a little sad thing, but still, uh, you've got to survive somehow, and they were pretty uh, successful predators, it seems. So, um, gestation for these guys lasts about 21 days, and they give birth to about 20 to 30 young standing up. And each weighs approximately 0 0.24 of a gram. Because being marsupials, they're pretty much born uh, very quickly. Then they move up to the pouch where they will latch onto the nipples inside the pouch. But they only have four nipples, so really only four of these babies will survive. And uh, then they'll be raised within the pouch. And there's where they grow about, about 40 days. They will become bigger and bigger and pretty much gestate. And uh, yeah... The conservation status of these guys, they are endangered because of a multitude of factors. They went extinct about 3,000 years ago um, in mainland Australia because of a mix of climate, also humans coming around, things like that. Dingoes is believed to have an impact. And um, there have been two major uh, population declines around 1909 and 1950 because of culling, but also road mortality and the devil facial uh, tumor disease, which has been observed, which has really been hitting a lot of these populations, which was one of the motivations to create an isolated population in mainland Australia to pretty much be free of this virus. So very topical thing, if you think about it, with uh, the pandemic going on. But... um. People almost kind of vilified them and they believe that they will eat humans as they have been known to eat dead bodies. But I still think they are wonderful animals regardless and have become kind of like a symbol of uh, in pop culture of Tasmania with Tassie Devil and such. Really are wonderful animals. How can you not love a good devil? I uh, really hope they get added to the game themselves. Really cool little animals. So yeah, now we're going to be moving on to another animal here. That was done by Leaf. This one was done by Seth and Mega Rex Gaming. We have got the Mugger Crocodile. So the Mugger Crocodile, also known as the Marsh Crocodile, is a 
freshwater crocodile that lives around the Indian subcontinent and southern Iran, also some parts of Southeast Asia, where they live in a bunch of artificial ponds, marshes, lakes and rivers. And they are not the biggest of crocodiles, I believe they are on average, let's see, they are a medium sized crocodile and they have the broadest snout among the uh, living crocodiles. They Adult females get between 2 and 2.5 meters on average, so about 6 foot 7 to 8 foot 2, and males about 3 to 3.5 meters, or 9 to 11 feet. They really grow over 5 meters, or 16 feet, and their largest one was about 18 feet uh, long. Though there have been one record that was believed to be 3 meters and uh, 195 kilograms, so pretty big animals regardless. So as I mentioned, these guys are found around south, uh, southern Iran, Pakistan, Nepal, India, Sri Lanka, and other places such as um, uh, the areas of Southeast Asia as well. And um, there's believed to be a small population in Pakistan. Also, they are considered endangered, I believe, they're vulnerable because of a bunch of different uh, factors in the habitat I'll explain soon. And are re recently uh, locally extinct in Myanmar. So these guys are powerful swimmers, like other crocodiles, they use to hunt their prey. And they are a thermoconformer, that means they have an optimal body heat of about 30 to 35 degrees uh, Celsius, or 86 to 95 degrees Fahrenheit. And risk dying of hypothermia when it's though exposed to uh, temperatures below 5 degrees, or 41 degrees Fahrenheit, or, about th or above 38 degrees, or 100 degrees Fahrenheit. So they also, like other crocodiles, they tend to dig burrows. Um, with the entrance that they can use to help thermoregulate and they tend to uh, remain at a constant temperature of between 19.2 uh, 19 to 29 degrees celsius in these burrows depending on the region so these guys are also known to prey on pretty much everything they have um, pretty much eat fish snakes monkeys uh, other mammals rodents shrimps beetles tortoises there was even one observed killing an indian pangolin and uh, yeah, pretty much whatever they can. Small argulates as well, up to the size of cheetahs. And another really, really interesting fact about these guys. Let's see if we can find the other one. Let's talk about her while we're there. Believe it or not, these guys have documented using tool use. So what they'll do is that um, they are the first recorded reptile to use tool use. So they do what they put is stinks, sticks and branches on their heads, which they use to help camouflage themselves. And that helps lure the birds because all oh, they're looking for nest material, or they need sticks. So that pretty much lures them to the crocodile and then they will attack the birds. So that's a really cool example of showing how intelligent crocodiles are. And um, female uh, mugga crocodiles will attain sexual maturity at about... 1.8 to 2.2 uh, meters long or about 5 to 7 feet long at age at about six and a half years old and males about 2.6 meters long and about the same age i believe that may be a little bit younger the reproduction cycle for these guys starts in november with the onset of the cold season with courtship and between fe february and june the females will make deep holes and make nests along the water side or they'll lay up to two clutches between 8 to 46 eggs with each egg weighing about 128 grams where the females will scrape sand over the nest and guard it until um, protect them and they, where they protect the babies. So they, what they'll do is around southern India between April and June and Sri Lanka about August to September. They hatch about two months after they have been laid and uh, the female will protect them for about a year. So um, the threats to these guys include habitat destruction because of conversion of their natural habitat to agriculture and industrial use and um, also erosion, uh, lots of draining of wetland habitats and muggers have been known to kill people so it is dangerous to um, obviously be around them in the wild so obviously that doesn't really help with their public reception but luckily they are considered uh, CITES 1 and there's belief that their population is less than 8,700 individuals in the wild and no population composes more of a thousand individuals so quite restricted and since they've been known to take livestock, that's another big issue. But yeah, hopefully there are us captive populations and it's cool to see, it'd be cool to see them return to a lot of their former numbers. Really cool animals, I really do like mugger crocodiles. Is it? Yeah, okay. So now we're going to move on to the next animal. This one was made by Seth again. We have got an elephant this time. We have got the Sri Lankan elephant. So. The Sri Lankan elephant is a recognized subspecies. I say that in quotes because it's not that well supported. 
that are native to the island of Sri Lanka, just uh, south of India. They've been uh, listed as endangered by the IUCN because their population has decreased. I believe the population estimated 2019 was about 7,000 individuals. And um, they're largely restricted to the dry zones of northeast and southeast uh, uh, Sri Lanka. And these guys are considered one of the largest subspecies of the quote-unquote, uh, obviously the subspecies quote-unquote, um, Asian elephant. So they get on uh, between 2 to 3.5 meters or 6.6 .6 to 11 over 5 feet and weigh between 2,000 and 550 kilograms and have 19 pairs of ribs. So these, uh, this uh, size estimates can be achieved by elephants that live in, on the mainland as well, which is another thing why I'm against this calling this subspecies. And only 7% of males will bear these uh, big tusks that you see here. And adult elephants, uh, adult elephant tusks grow up to about 6 feet long and weigh up to 35 kilograms. So the reason I say the subspecies is let poorly defined is because through genetic evidence it shows that there was a lot of interbreeding there's not really a new uh, genes or unique contribution into the Sri Lankan population they just seem to be a mix of the two main clades that live in mainland Asia which live in both India and China uh, so yes but still wonderful animals regardless along with uh, India Southeast Asia but yeah, as I mentioned, they're found around uh, the lowlands and dry uh, around um, Sri Lanka. And they used to be a lot more common. I believe the early 19th century, the population was estimated to be about 20,000 until people started hunting them and collecting them. And they also do have a pretty important part in human history. These were the ones that were most often used as war elephants since they were believed to be the biggest. So often they would be uh, taken out and used in, used in war in before obviously the 20th century, such as uh, with Alexander the Great and things like that. And like uh, mainland elephants, these guys are mega herbivores that consume a large amount of food where they will uh, go around searching for food in the forests and uh, very important to these forests because they often spread seeds that other animals cannot spread and also help clear the canopy of, by pushing down trees that allows them to uh, uh, plants at the, and the, under the canopy to grow up and get more sunlight. That's really, really cool. Threats of these guys include uh, lots of landmines. There's been a total of about 260 elephants that have died from gunshot wounds or killed by poachers and landmines. That's a big issue with poaching as well. Also habitat degradation. But luckily there's been lots of conservation. There's elephant orphages in Sri Lanka also. Um, Lots of good national protections in place, and it seems their population are increasing, so that's a very, very good sign. And speaking of increased populations, look at these cute little babies. So very, very cute. Really wonderful. So now we're going to be moving on after we talk about the female. Really, really wonderful animal. So moving on from one subspecies to another, we have got the tiger this time. We have got the Malayan tiger, also made by Seth. I don't know what happened to that. But yep, look at these wonderful guys. We've got a white tiger as well. It's a lucky us. So um, the Malayan tiger is believed to be a subspecies of the, um, obviously, your normal tiger. That is native to uh, Malaysia, which is the peninsula. And their population is classified as critically endangered. There's believed to be no more than about 350 individuals. And likely there's about 200 breeding individuals within their population. So critically endangered, sadly. And they only live in two isolated areas within the peninsula. So a little bit of taxonomy on these guys. In 2017, they were lumped under the kind of mainland um, tiger subspecies within tigris. Tigris? Tigris. And, but there has been some other evidence to suggest that these guys would be their own subspecies, which would be Panthera tigris uh, jacksoni which is probably the most accurate one. But there's not really too many uh, visual differences between Indo-Chinese tigers and Malayan tigers. Uh, though they appear to be smaller than Bengal tigers. And they get on average for a male is about 8 foot 6 and a female 7 foot 10. And their height ranges from 58 to 104 centimeters or 23 to 41 inches. And their body weight is estimated to be between 52 and uh, 95, 195 pounds. Or 24 to 88 kilograms so these guys generally get um 
no more than 130 kilograms, not the particularly biggest population. We'll have a look at the white one, we'll talk about them. So as I mentioned, these guys are really only found in two isolated populations around uh, Malaysia, the peninsula. And um, yeah, they feed on all sorts of things. They feed on wild boar, uh, sambar deer, um, also believed to prey on sun bears, young elephants and rhinoceros calves, adult gar and uh, tapir, just pretty much whatever large animal they can get their uh, mouths around. But sadly for these guys, um, Habitat fragmentation has been a big issue, especially for uh, palm oil plantations. Also for poaching because these guys are used in traditional medicines, uh, which has really hurt their populations as well. But luckily these guys are considered CITES ones. There are good protections in place. And there are populations in captivity, in particular in Kuala Lumpur, and also there's ones in Cincinnati Zoo that are Malayan. Um, so luckily there is good protection in place, and hopefully we help these tigers in the future and hope they don't go extinct. I hope they don't get the fate of the South China tiger, which is believed to be uh, extinct in the wild. They're still wonderful animals regardless. And look at these cute babies. Aren't they adorable? So yeah, last but most definitely not least, we've got this last mod that was done by Leaf. Oh, I'll keep pressing that again. What am I doing? We have got the elephants, uh, not the elephant seal, the leopard seal. Really, really wonderful animal. Look at these guys. <laughs> so, also referred to as a sea leopard, they are the second largest species of seal in the Arctic. Uh, second only to the southern elephant seal. And uh, only uh, the next predator is the killer whale, or the orca. So, these guys are pretty distinctive. As you can see, they've got the spotted, spotted and molted pattern, which is similar to a leopard, hence the name leopard seal. And they also have these really long and... Uh, kind of almost uh, leopard, uh, reptilian-like uh, head. They kind of look very reptilian, but they're really wonderful. So um, these guys also have uh, front teeth that are sharp like other carnivores, but their molars lock together in a way that allows them to filter krill. So that's very similar to animals such as the crab eater seal, which feeds almost exclusively on krill. So they're able to filter that as well. But these guys also feed on a lot of other things. They all feed on penguins and... Um, other fish, uh, even baby seals of other species, pretty much whatever they can get their mouths around again. Other birds, seabirds, other fish, but they will eat a lot of krill. So these guys, the females are usually slightly larger than males. The overall length of adults typically gets between 2.4 and 3.5 meters, or 7 to 11 feet long, and they weigh between 200 and 600 kilograms, or between 440 and 1,320 pounds, which makes them the same length as a northern walrus, but usually half the weight. So yeah, still pretty interesting. So these guys have actually been having an expanding range recently, which is really interesting. These guys usually live, uh, believed to normally live around the um, southern ocean, so around um, Antarctica and also some other smaller islands around there. But there have been populations that have been uh, believed to be, because of human hunting, of course, um, extirpated from certain areas and they're believed to be slowly returning. Places like New Zealand uh, has ancient evidence of populations of leopard seals living there along with um, ones that are moving in now, such as Ofa the leopard seal. She's become a bit of a local celebrity here. And also places in um, South America have had reports of breeding uh, leopard seals. Though there have been other evidence of vagrants, and the most northern vagrant was actually found in the Cook Islands. So that's a pretty interesting, but they're also found uh, west coast of Australia and South Africa are uh, some vagrant pop, uh, individuals. So these guys uh, spend most of uh, their life within the pack ice uh, towards throughout the year in kind of a solitary, except the mother and newborn uh, pup. And they can generally move pretty good, and they are considered least concerned. Though they're solitary, the females really bead in lower latitudes. And um, the estimated population is believed to be between 220,000 and 440,000 individuals, which makes them least concerned, which is good. So these guys are also very, very vocal. Uh, uh, during the summer and the male seals will produce loud calls which are kind of used to attract females and along with other vocalizations they'll make with like um, barks and cricket like uh, trills along with long haunting moans they're very very vocal seals it's really interesting and um, these guys it's not much known about the reproduction but the females are believed to be uh, polygamous and pretty much will mate with multiple uh, male will mate mortal females and vice versa 
and it's actually the active female, about three to seven, can give birth to a single pup during the summer on floating ice or also on um, the beach in places where there's no uh, ice year round, such as New Zealand and South uh, America. So uh, a newborn pup generally weighs about 66 pounds and we usually um, will usually hang out with their mother for a month. Uh, well, obviously they hang out with their mother for longer than that, but they will nurse for about a month. Uh, before they're weaned off and the mother kind of does her own thing but the baby um, the father does not take care of the puppy goes off does his own thing and um after taking care of the pup she will go to a solitary lifestyle after the breeding season and kind of just do her own thing and uh as i mentioned these guys only natural predator is the killer whale and they have pretty big canine teeth about two and a half centimeters or one inches where they feed on a wide variety of creatures these guys, especially young leopard seals, will feed mostly on krill, uh, squid, and fish. Though adults are much more uh, flexible. They will eat a lot of krill because it's uh, very, very common. But they'll also eat lots of penguins, including king, elalade, uh, rock hopper, gentoo, and chinchat penguins. Also other seals um, and uh, fur seal pups and young southern elephant seals. Uh, there's also been record records of, uh, in South Georgia, they'll eat Antarctic fur seals and Antarctic krill. Uh, see other seabirds they're pretty much one of the top predators of these ecosystems so they have no issue though um these guys even though most of their uh, habitat doesn't encompass places where people are there is risk since they are especially moving to places like new zealand and south america where are populated they do pose risks to people and there have been some fatal attacks in uh, their native range from people going down and snorkeling with them uh but um there's actually believed that uh, Ofa, the one I mentioned before, she's been uh, climbing on pontoons and breaking them, causing damage. But luckily she hasn't killed anyone yet. In fact, she was shot. So that's a bad thing that happens to them. But yeah, as we carry on, look at these wonderful, uh, wonderful guys. So these guys, luckily, as I mentioned, they have few natural predators and they have high populations, so they're least concerned. But as I've got to reiterate, climate change is a big issue for these guys since the polar ice will diminish because of global warming. Uh, so uh, there will be less habitat for these seals to breed and less habitat for the krill that they eat as well to live under and uh, forage on. So that is a big issue. So obviously climate change, climate change, climate change. Try and uh, try and reduce your carbon footprint a little bit. Um, but yeah. Really, really wonderful species and a really, really wonderful mod. So I think this would be a great place to end unless we want to go watch them swim. I think we'll let them swim. They've had a bit of a sleepy time. We'll spend a little bit of time and talk about them swimming. So these guys also live for about 26 years. Uh, and there have been some in captivity. There's, I believe, uh, there's a park that used to be in New Zealand, Napier, a uh, marine land Napier. They had leopard seals. Also, more recently, Taronga Zoo had a couple, and I think 2014 was the last time they really had them. But they have been basically just rescued vagrants. But yeah, we'll still have a look at this guy going. Really, really cool. You can have a dive. Have a dive for me. There we are. Really, really cool. Really interesting to see if this guy gets a. Uh, what other mods and stuff will get coming, especially after this update. So yeah, we've got a good look at you swimming. I think now will be a good time to end our video. So yeah, I um, really, really, really hope you guys like and subscribe. Always remember to hit that little bell icon to get notified when I'm anything. So yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. I hope you guys like and subscribe and bye bye